Now, the reports of rebels cornering Gaddafi have come in just after Italy promised to hand over some frozen funds. Do you think the opposition is sending out optimistic messages in order to prove they are actually worth the cash? In this entire operation, we have to stress the role of the big lie, of the manufactured propaganda story. You'll remember on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, we were told Gaddafi had left the country, Saif had been captured, one of his sons, Kamis had been captured, the Kamis Brigade had stopped fighting, uh, one other son, Mohammed, was allegedly in custody. It turned out all to be a big lie. We even have pretty, I think, pretty reliable reports that the initial photographs of the rebel rabble entering Green Square, that was actually a Hollywood soundstage located in Doha, Qatar, where these events were actually faked. Uh, psychological warfare, fake TV broadcasts, and the whole business. Now, these rebels are obviously trying to hype, they're trying to cover the fact that they don't control Tripoli and that the Gaddafi command structure is now, uh, it's certainly intact. You've got Gaddafi, you've got most of his sons, you've got Musa Ibrahim, the uh, spokesman and information minister, and now they don't have to defend fixed positions. So the in a certain way, the military situation of the rebels has deteriorated because instead of the Gaddafi people defending fixed lines that can then be bombed by NATO, which is the main thing that was happening, carpet bombing uh, with Paveway 4 and uh, brimstone rockets from the Royal Air Force and uh, Apache helicopters from the U.S. and U.S. drones, the Gaddafi people are now free to move around. So they don't, they're not going to hold a fixed position like the the compound, they're going to be moving around, and that puts them on a more equal footing with the rebels. It tends to minimize, especially in an urban setting, the results of the NATO air superiority. Can we talk about the U.S. agenda in all of this? In 2008, the then U.S. Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, she shared a late-night dinner with Gaddafi, opening what seemed like a new chapter in the U.S.-Libyan relations. And now, the U.S. is at uh, the forefront of this campaign to topple him, along with their NATO partners. How worried should other American allies actually feel at this point in the way that uh, America has adopted this uh, rather alternative viewpoint towards Libya? Well, we, we are, of course, in the throes now. We're in the, the sixth or seventh or eighth month of a campaign by the CIA and the State Department to essentially cripple or destroy or maim every nation state in the area by destabilizing their governments. And you remember their timetable was Ben Ali was supposed to fall in January. He did. They were able to get Mubarak out with some very heavy threats coming from Samantha Power and from Michael McFowl and people in the National Security Council giving orders to Field Marshal Tantawi. Gaddafi was supposed to fall in March. He has essentially gummed up the works. He has assumed a blocking position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the NATO subversion machine, and he's kept them tied up now for six or seven months. Uh, if Gaddafi resistance were to subside, which I do not think will happen, these military assets that we presently see deployed in the central Mediterranean will be moved to the eastern Mediterranean. And there, Hezbollah and Syria, and ultimately Iran, had better watch out because they're also uh, targets. Uh, and remember, this then gets into Iran and, and also Russia because of that important uh, naval station at Tartus, Syria, which is the base of the Russian uh, Mediterranean squadron. So if it's, if it's uh, calming down in Libya, that simply means that this war will move, move east. But I think right now we're, we're looking at a very long war in Libya. Let's compare Gaddafi to, um, well, we, I don't want to compare him to Mullah Omar, but you know, that was 10 years ago. Mullah Omar is still operating with no problems. Uh, Gaddafi, I think, uh, can, can go on one better. So uh, don't, don't look for Gaddafi to be rounded up anytime. And even if he is, there's an extended family here, and there's indeed a, an extended tribe. The tribal organization in Libya is ideal for conducting a resistance under these conditions. All right, well, um, Prime Minister Berlusconi, let's look at the European agenda here. He's promised half a billion dollars. Uh, uh, the very same leader who was actually filmed kissing the hand of Gaddafi at a meeting, what, back in 2010. Um, what, what does that tell us about the European stance? Many would say the word hypocrisy. Uh, it, does this actually show that European Ooh. support is, is actually for sale here? 
Th these are simply the maneuvers of people who are too weak to have a, a frontal opposition against the U.S. and the British. Remember that Berlusconi was targeted in the same WikiLeaks document dump that set up Ben Ali and Gaddafi and, and Mubarak. Uh, why do the Anglo-Americans hate Berlusconi? Because he's a close personal friend of Putin and because he's an active participant in the South Stream pipeline. Now, if we look at this Libyan adventure specifically, Italy is the biggest loser. Uh, ENI, E-N-I, the Italian state oil company founded by the great Enrico Mattei back in the 1950s, was the principal participant in the Libyan uh, oil fields. And as you mentioned, the Italians relied on this. Right? What you see right now is an attempt by the French adventurer Sarkozy and his group to essentially push the Italians out. And what you saw today with the visit of this, uh, this character, Jibril, in Rome and Milan, is the Italians are attempting to pay tribute to the new vandals in Benghazi and maybe in Tripoli if they're lucky, although maybe not. The new vandals are demanding tribute. So the Italians say, we'll give you money. We'll even give you free oil and gas. They're simply trying to counterbalance the inside track that the French uh, have. If you look at this situation, though, you know, the last time you had the vandals in North Africa back in the 400s AD, the stuff that St. Augustine wrote about, when the Vandals took over what today would be Algeria, Tunisia, and, and Libya, they began delving then into Sicily, to Sardinia, to Corsica, uh, and southern Italy. They eventually sacked Rome in 455. So uh, we are now facing an Al-Qaeda sanctuary, if these rebels assert their power. We'll have an Al-Qaeda sanctuary uh, in the Mediterranean, we're going to have Al-Qaeda pirates in the Mediterranean. The entire complexion of these places is going to change very, very rapidly. Italy will be the biggest loser. We saw some hint of that with the, the flux of the refugees into Lampedusa and similar islands. Something much bigger, right. but now mixed in with rebels who have all that money, the 80 billion, the weapons and the support. Okay, Webster, we'll leave it there. Very interesting to hear your thoughts. Webster Tarpley joining us live there in Washington. Thank you.